Um, my thanks to Corrine Mogg for her kind words of introduction and to the Planning Committee of the Congress for inviting me to speak. I'm honored to be given the opportunity to address so many colleagues, uh, some old and some new. By way of introduction to what has become a half century of examining Calvin and other early modern reform thinkers, I feel the need to be honest, uh, once for once, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. And, it, and admit that it was not at all planned. When I arrived at Duke in the fall of 1972, my research interest, believe it or not, was concerned with Anglican ecclesiastical politics from the Seven Bishops case in 1688 to the end of the Bangorian controversy in 1719. I even had an outline and a pile of research toward a dissertation. Obviously, that one never happened. This was not an area of research interest current to anyone on the faculty at Duke, and my coursework quickly led me in other directions. I did some work on Calvin's exegesis in my first and second years, and I also researched works by Theodore Beza and William Perkins. I proceeded to develop a dissertation outline on Perkins, which is the second dissertation that I didn't write. <laughs> no, no. No. There's one person who I never met, not by the way counting Calvin, Beza, or Perkins, who should receive some credit for helping me arrive at the topic of the dissertation that I actually did write. His name is Basil Hall, the author of an essay called Calvin Against the Calvinists. It seemed to me even then that the essay was riddled with problems. Hall identified Calvin's theology, quote, as a careful balance of complementary doctrines which can be seen in his institutes, especially in the final edition of 1599. This Hall declared was what Calvinism ought to be. This careful balance was distorted by Theodore Beza and all but obliterated by William Perkins. Hall makes his basic point concerning Beza, um, for those of you who haven't read this rather ancient piece, um, largely drawn from a cursory reading of Beza's brief 1555 Tabula Predestinationis, as a system of theology ordered differently from Calvin's 1559 Institutes. Perkins, in Hall's view, took his departure from Beza, and in his theological system, so emphasized predestination that he undercut the means of grace and omitted the doctrine of the church. It seemed to me then, as it does now, that Hall's essay was highly reductionistic. Worried over the ordering of doctrine rather than definition, focused on a limited number of documents that Hall took to be emblematic of Calvinist system, namely Bayes' Tabula and Perkins' Golden Chain, neither of which ever claimed to be a theological system, or in less anachronistic terms, either claimed to be a series of theological lozi or disputations, such as were one of the ingredients of Calvin's Institutes. And Hall's whole project begged the question, of what a carefully balanced theology might be, and who in the world might be capable of making such a determination. After reading Hall's essay, I made an appointment with David Steinmetz and let him know that I thought Hall was thoroughly mistaken. His response was that I now disagreed with nearly everybody in the field, <laughs> you know, including him. But then he added with a grin that if I was right, I'd found a good dissertation topic. And that's the dissertation I wrote. And ever since, in good Hollywood production style, I've been writing prequels to it, <laughs> you know, trying to work out what I wish I had known prior to engaging in the topic of the dissertation. Or to state the issue in a different way, the dissertation was devoted to an attempt to argue that something, namely a major discontinuity between Calvin and those Calvinists, wasn't easily identified and the entire issue required far more nuance than was found in Hall's essay, um, as well as in a fairly large array of other works in the same era. My prequels, written and being written ever since, have been trying to get a sense of what was there, hopefully stripping away or at least cordoning off various theological and philosophical mythologies without importing another set of value-laden judgments concerning theological balance or anachronistically imposed central dogmatic or philosophical motifs. <laughs> Presently, my effort is a new edition of my four-volume Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics, building in references to significant works written in the field since 2003, 
or to early modern works of which I have been made aware since then, and there are quite a few. Plus a fifth volume on philosophical issues and their implications for theology. And then there are all those shorter pieces that keep on getting generated that I just don't plan to put into the bigger, bigger work. Um, but always trying to arrive at a clearer sense of the issues and patterns of early modern theological and philosophical discourse. That issue of getting what was, getting at what was actually there in early modern reform thought is the subject of my brief reflection this afternoon, which I plan on confining to what I think of as varieties of contextualized intellectual history. When I'm finished, please don't ask why I have omitted 10 or 15 good lines of possible research. The answer is simply that I've only got 20 minutes. First, a note on resourcing, which accounts for what has been the most genuinely momentous shift in scholarly direction. Major strides have been made and are ongoing to provide new critical editions of Calvin's works, as well as critical editions of works of his contemporaries like Bullinger and Vire, perhaps most notably editions of Letters of the Reformers, and either of previously unpublished documents or of early modern printings that have never seen modern editions. And then there are those massive digitization projects. Anyone in this field who's close to my age could easily remember the limited resources that were once available and this vast terra incognita of unavailable or unidentifiable materials that sat waiting to be excavated. Apart from the early English book series, then on hard to read microfilm, one had to depend either on the limited resources of a university rare book room or scrape together funding to travel to other rare book rooms. Um, then, of course, there were microfiche. But like dinosaurs and floppy disks, both of those media forms, film and fiche, are now largely extinct and have fortunately been made available as PDF files. Today, given those massive digitization projects, vast resources are readily made and readily available anywhere. I often tell people I have on my hard drive a 16th, 17th century library that is better in my field than Oxford Bodleian Library. The reason is that thanks to Ebo, I have everything that I want from the Bodleian. And then all those other projects have given me things that the Bodleian doesn't have. What do those developments, new critical editions and digitization projects, mean for directions in the studies of Calvin and the Reformed tradition? In the first place, they point both to the ability and to the need to reread Calvin in the context of a rich and variegated world of early modern thought. Not that it's improper to do research focused on various aspects of Calvin's thought, but it's inadvisable to do so without placing his thought either into a closely defined context or its connection with predecessors and contemporaries. Finely grained analysis of Calvin's and other reformed writers thought that were not only nearly impossible, but also quite unimaginable 50 years ago, or even 25 years ago, are now both imaginable and possible. One of the major contexts of Calvin's thought often ignored in the scholarship on Calvin is the thought of Calvin's contemporaries. In particular, those contemporaries with whom he largely agreed and who often influenced his thought. This neglect can be illustrated from numerous works entitled The Theology of Calvin or Calvin's Theology of dot, dot, dot. A quick examination of the footnotes in many of these works yields a mass of citations of Calvin citations of differing lines of modern scholarship on Calvin, and virtually no references to any early modern writer other than Calvin. The danger of those presentations of Calvin is that the reformer's thought is assessed not contextually, but in juxtaposition with a series of discordant modern identifications of Calvinian theology, in order to ascertain which of these identifications seems most likely. Given the amount of highly varied modern assessments of Calvin's theology, one way to extricate Calvin from this tangle is first, before you dig too far into Calvin, to read Vire, or Vermigli, or Musculus, or Hyperius, or Bullinger, and others, if only to get a sense of how 16th century Protestants thought more generally and widely before addressing a topic in Calvin's writings. The thought of these others has not been as thoroughly filtered through 19th and 20th century theological interpretations, as is Calvin's thought. <laughs> 
The work of those contemporaries, particularly his immediate associates, can and should be juxtaposed chronologically with Calvin's writings and issues of development and possible influence drawn out. And of course, in this connection, Calvin's own thought should be examined chronologically in terms of developing or changing formulae generated by different contexts, different adversaries, different dialogue with trusted colleagues. Arguably, Calvin ought to be examined inter pares, but not always as primus. If one could drop into one of those recently discovered ring wormholes, I read about them the other day on Yahoo, uh, and visit mid 16th century Basel or Bern and ask someone, who is the most important Protestant preacher or exegete, odds are the answer would not have been Calvin. Even among Genevan publishers, other theologians' works were readily represented. I noted that in the year after Calvin's death, Genevan publishers saw fit to print a French translation of Andreas Hyperius' catechetical Elementa Christiana Religionis, a French translation of Bullinger's Decades, and then in 1588, marvelous to behold, a French translation of Hyperius' major theological work, the Methodist Theologiae, indicating a perceived need on the part of those publishers for another, a different vernacular summation of theology. Beyond such published works, the Calvin inter pares non semper primus approach needs to be further investigated in and through the reformers' networks of correspondence. I was going to say this even before I heard about the digitization project yesterday, um, but even more so now. The availability of these materials, it did extend back in old collections of Calvin's and Lasky's letters, the Zurich letters and so forth, but it's been recently greater, greatly expanded through the efforts of new critical editions of Calvin, Bullinger, and Vire. Add to this the digital correspondence projects noted yesterday. In addition to their narrative debate, consultation, and complaint, patterns of letters sent from one writer to another and then information passed on to still others reveals relationships, influences, nuances of engagement in a detail and perspective not available from published tracts and treatises. For example, it's fairly clear from correspondence that Calvin's understanding of union with Christ was deeply indebted to Vermigli. Or on another, there was a significant web of theological and political figures, Calvin, Bullinger, Lasky, and others, involved in correspondence concerning the trials of Reformation in Poland. The letters will remain a fruitful field for some time to come, particularly if the network of correspondence is examined in detail and in limited time frames with reference to particular issues and events. <laughs> Along similar lines, much can still be done in targeted examination of Calvin's exegesis of biblical texts in relation to the work of other exegetes. Here again, there's already been significant work. But the issue of Calvin's place in the development of Protestant exegetical tradition hasn't yet been fully addressed. Work is still to be done to further our sense of the reformers' sources, not only which sources were used, but what specifically did they mean and contribute to Calvin's and others' interpretations of texts. Calvin's and his contemporaries' impact on the later exegetical tradition also requires further examination. For example, on the one hand, Calvin's commentaries were gleaned and consistently, consistently on a wild series of issues by the English exegete John Mayer in his commentary on the Old and New Testaments. A lot of it is just quotes from Calvin. On the other hand, Calvin's much vaunted resistance to filling his Old Testament commentaries, notably the Psalms, with Trinitarian and Christological content was frequently ignored by later Reformed commentators. Commentators who could not have been accused of Judaizing by their Lutheran counterparts. And the question arises then precisely how and how much did Calvin's exegesis impact the later Reformed tradition? If one looks at the broader history of early modern Reformed thought, namely the work of those many writers who did not choose to be called Calvinists, and that's most of them, the possibilities multiply. Those contemporaries of Calvin, Bure, Vermigli, Musculus, Bullinger, Hyperius, and others, can and should be studied in their own right, along similar lines, not as merely contributing to the contextual analysis of Calvin's work. In the case of many of these writers, particularly as one moves into the late 16th and early 17th centuries, where there are few modern critical editions, focused collections like the Meter Center and the digitization projects become of even greater importance. <laughs> 
And there is so much to do in so many directions that I can only give a few examples. One area of interest, unless I've missed a major line of research, is the development of Protestant theological and philosophical vocabulary. The reformers, notably Calvin, were quite explicit concerning their hesitance to take up the intricacies of scholastic Latin vocabulary, although in many cases it was unavoidable. Given pressures of polemics, positive formulation, and developing academic curricula, with great emphasis on the latter, um, later Protestant writers had increasing recourse to technical vocabulary. Taken together, their works provide access to a developing Protestant theological and philosophical usage, sometimes including identification of sources. And then the 16th century translations of these works offer insight into the early modern process of creating a vernacular language of theology that certainly for Protestants was either absent or lacked fluency at the beginning of the 16th century, but was distinctly present in force and fluency by the end of the century. I mean, I would count in particular on the English scene the examples of Thomas Norton, the first, and if we pay attention to T.H.L. Parker, the most accurate of the four published translations of Cowan's Institutes, and Henry Parry, unsung hero, whose translation of Ursinus Catechetical Lectures involved the use of a technical English that was definitely not available at all earlier in the century. There's also the issue of academic context, as illustrated by the curricular change and documented in the published disputations of various academies and universities. Academic, academic disputation, although it did adapt stylistically to changing models of argument, remained a staple throughout the early modern era. The disputations served several purposes. Of course, they marked the educational progress of students in practice or private disputations, and then disputations conducted for the degree. Since there are fewer publications of disputations, though, that include student responses, they, they seem to be very rare, the majority of disputations don't reveal as much about the minds of the students as they do about the basic issues being addressed in the curriculum and what presiding professors intended to display. As such, the disputations, particularly as gathered together and published in collections, tell us a great deal, both about the basic directions of thought of the presiders and about the public face of the institutions, the public theology of the institutions, or the public philosophy, as the case may be. There is, from an institutional and curricular perspective, much remaining to be done in tracing the development from the originally large linguistic biblical theological curricula of Protestant schools to the highly complex and multi-subject curricula of Protestant schools in the 17th century, as illustrated in the encyclopedic, in the encyclopedic works of writers like Keckermann and Alsted. A useful tool in this area, by the way, is the Scholastica section of the PRDL website. If you haven't looked at it yet, you should. Another line of research that has been exceedingly fruitful is the examination of early modern thought, including Calvin, but looking beyond him to other authors on other issues, natural law, and recently ethics. The long-standing notion of an absence of virtue ethics among so-called Calvinists, placed there either because of a misapplication of the doctrine of predestination or of a misreading of early modern reformed understandings of sin, grace, and human freedom, has been overthrown by recent scholarship. The scholarship has gone so far as to identify the importance of Aristotelian ethical concepts in Calvin's thought, and then to begin to map out trajectories of traditional virtue ethics, indeed of teleological virtue ethics among the reformed. This line of research is also related to academic and curricular development in reformed academies and universities, in which traditional topics were added during the course of the 16th century. Given Melanchthon's, Vermigli's, and Hyperius efforts, Aristotelian ethics never did drop out of curricular sight, and it flowered among the Reformed in the second half of the 16th and continued on into the 17th century. The same can be said of Aristotelian physics. Both of these areas of research hold out much promise. Well, let me, com let me conclude my comments by reiterating my thanks to the planners of this Congress for giving me this opportunity, and adding a word of thanks to my colleagues both those present in the auditorium and those absent, whose work and whose collegiality has maintained my interest, 
piqued my curiosity and provided much constructive dialogue for five decades. So I thank you. Thank you.